Hi, welcome to our talk on Android graphics. I'm Chad Haas. I'm Samir Kataria. And we are on the Android graphics team, and the Android graphics team basically writes the software that gets the pixels to the screen, which involves the drawing operations, figuring out what the color values are, and it also involves a lot of work on high-performance rendering. Speaking of which... Let's talk about low-latency graphics. So, when you're using a pen or stylus with your Android device, you might notice that as you draw a stroke, the rendering of pixels sometimes lags behind where your stylus is on the screen. The reason this happens is because Android utilizes multi-buffered rendering. Multi-buffered rendering starts with input, which goes to the app. This is written to a buffer, and this buffer is passed around to another part of the OS. This part of the OS then actually displays it on the screen and renders out the pixels. This can take a little bit of time. There is another way to do this, and it's called front-buffered rendering. Front-buffered rendering has the app writing to the same buffer that the display is reading from, and this takes much less time. This is the ideal way to render for stylus input. It is possible on Android using OpenGL on almost all versions of Android. But historically, we haven't given platform support for it in our APIs until Android 13, where we added it to hardware buffers. Today, we're also introducing a Jetpack Low Latency library to implement this in a backwards-compatible way for stylus-friendly surfaces. Please check out the talk, Adding Stylus Support for Your Android App, for more information, but I'll describe the high-level architecture here. Think of it as two different layers, one on top of the other. The top layer is front-buffered and is called the active stroke layer. The bottom layer, where the rest of your app's UI is normally drawn, is multi-buffered and it's called the committed content layer. So starting with the stylus input, this all happens on the front buffered layer. We draw a stroke, still rendering it as fast as we can. And then when we lift up, it is committed to the content be layer behind it. So you get the best of both worlds. You get a fast uh, response to the stroke being drawn, and you get multi-buffered rendering behind it. All right, so let's talk about something completely different, blurs. So you could do blurs before, but it wasn't necessarily obvious how to do that. We're making that a lot easier as of Android 12. But before we talk about blurs, let's talk about how drawing happens on Android. In general, most drawing operations, even when it's just a UI element on the screen, go through a series of primitive operations at low-level APIs like Canvas and Paint and Drawable, stuff like that. So a typical operation looks something like this, where we have a draw line command, and that has really three portions to it. One is the operation that's happening. In this case, we're drawing a line. The other is the placement of that thing. Where are we going to start and end? What is the size of this ob object? And then finally, what are the attributes? How are we going to draw this line? What is it actually going to look like? The attributes are collected into the paint object, which stores the information about how each object is drawn. There are simple attributes like what color am I going to draw the line? Or how wide is that line going to be? Or do I want to fill this rectangle versus draw an outline of the rectangle versus both? There are also more complex and interesting effects like color filter that changes the color of each pixel as it goes through the rendering system. Or shader, which gives you things like linear or radial gradients or bitmaps. And that tells the, tells the system when I draw this line or this rectangle, I'm going to sample those pixel colors from some bitmap off screen, and then I'm going to basically draw that bitmap out into the area. But each of these operations is going to be very manual. You set one of these attributes on the paint object, and then in a custom view, you're going to call one of these canvas commands to draw a line with the paint that holds this information. But what if you want all of that, all of those attributes applied to the overall view? Well, that's why we introduced the render effect API in Android 12. This allows you to collect all of that information together so that you don't have to have a custom view and go operation by operation through. You're just telling the view, these are the attributes that I want to apply. So to do this, you call set render effect on a view, and then you don't need to do all these things manually. Uh, there are several effects that we build into this API to begin with, things like drawing from a bitmap or color filter stuff that I mentioned before or blending modes, and there's blur. 
So let's talk about blur. So first of all, I wrote this simple demo over on the right. As I draw, drag the seek bar back and forth, you can see the blur radius is changing for both X and Y, and it tells us the area that we're going to use to get the information for each of the resulting pixels. I should point out, don't write an app like that. You don't want a seek bar and make the user pick uh, some blurry background, but this was me playing with the effect to figure out how things worked and what the visuals are going to be like for a UI effect that we will see a little bit later where I pop out information on top of a blurred background. So how does this work? As the seek bar gets dragged around, we get this listener called and there we call update effect with the current value of the progress. And update effect then takes that value and says, well, if it's zero, then we're not going to set a render effect at all. And instead, we're going to set render effect to null. But if it's greater than zero, it's going to be a value in this case from one to 50. Then we're going to create a blur effect with the radius that results from that value. And then we're going to set the render effect on the container. It's going to blur everything inside of it. Okay, let's talk about surface view and texture view, which are two different ways of embedding content into your app's view hierarchy. So surface view has been around since the beginning of Android. And the core concept with the surface view is that it cuts a hole through your app's view hierarchy down to a surface, and that surface is assigned a hardware overlay. You can think of this as a second window that is more power efficient and supports high dynamic range rendering. So here's visually what would be happening. You have your app surface. We literally cut a hole. We put the surface view surface underneath it so it can render through it. Texture view, on the other hand, has been available since API 14. It's meant for deep integration into the view hierarchy. So content is drawn to an off-screen buffer and copied back into the view hierarchy. And you should note that this is like an extra operation or it takes a little bit of extra time. So it's less efficient than a surface view. So this gets to our recommendation. We think surface view is the way to go for most cases. Media content can be shown in HDR. DRM playback is only possible using a surface view. Uh, games are already using surface view and we recommend that they keep doing so because they control their own content generation. Uh, texture view does have some specific use cases that it's useful for. For example, if you want to use view level primitives like rotation, alpha, render effects, clipping, etc. Um, also, if you need to uh, sandwich something between two different views, a texture view is the only way to do it. As I said, a surface view cuts a hole, so you know it's not as po possible to do it there. Um, so in short, use a surface view. All right, now let's talk about AGSL, Android Graphics Shading Language, which is basically pixel shaders as of the Android 13 release. So I mentioned shaders before, but, and those have been in the API for many years, but those are fixed function shaders. They, you can pass in parameters for those kinds of shaders, the, the linear and radial gradient stuff. Those are essentially shaders, which are altering the value of each pixel along the way. But you can't really have a lot of flexibility there. In Android 13, we give you full on pixel shaders, which allows you to write your own code and pass in functionality and logic that is going to dynamically determine what happens to each of those pixel values. So first of all, let's talk about what pixel shaders are. I should note that the correct term for anybody that wants to correct me in this video is fragment shader. That is what people actually talk about. They're kind of the same thing, except fragment is really about the stuff that is visual that is going to be altered on the screen as opposed to pixels, which are every element on the screen. They're kind of synonymous. Pixel is a more common word, so I'm using it here uh, so that it's not as confusing. Anyway, a pixel shader is the code that is going to run on every single pixel of an image to determine the final color value that shows up. All right, so here we see some simple code on the screen that shows a shader that is going to create a particular visual when it is run on every single pixel of a rendering surface. So you can think about this shader basically running on every pixel that you are seeing, resulting in this, which is a lot more interesting than the code that was on the screen before. So if you go to skia.org, you can see other examples of that shader as well as some other ones. So here you can see me clicking through the shaders on the left, uh, and you can see the code that represents that shader on the right, and then the visuals in the middle. Some pretty interesting stuff going on here, very graphically interesting, dynamic, custom content, which is great, 
But what I want to focus on today is how would you use shaders in more of a, a dynamic UI situation as opposed to just full on custom graphics? That is also possible. Well, so let's see how that works. First of all, what is ADSL? As I said, it's Android graphics shading language. It is basically SKSL full on. It is the Skia shading language. We renamed it for Android. So it'd be a little less confusing name wise. And it's very similar to GLSL ES 1.0. So if you have written shaders in OpenGL, it's going to look really, really similar to you. The difference between GLSL and SKSL or AGSL is GLSL integrates uh, that shader into the GPU pipeline. And that basically says, here is what that pixel or fragment value is going to be. In Skia, it is going to integrate that shader into the rest of the shaders that are operating on that fragment. It's doing things like clip bounds checking and anti-aliasing computations. All of that gets compiled into one shader that runs all of this code. So you can think of this as being injecting your or shader code into the overall Skia rendering pipeline. Uh, it, one of the interesting things I think about shaders is that, gee, it seems like a lot of operations are happening on every pixel. Maybe I shouldn't use shaders because that sure seems like a lot of work. But the truth is we've been doing this since we enabled hardware acceleration way back in Android Honeycomb. This is how GPUs work. They run code to calculate the color values for every single pixel. The only difference here is we're allowing you to add a little bit of code and customize what that shader is doing for each pixel, as opposed to just letting the system compile its standard stuff, given the other attributes that you passed in for the drawing operations. So the way that you use AJSL is basically create a runtime shader. You pass in a string, which is the code that you want it to use. It will compile that string and then it'll cache that in the system. And then you set the shader on a pane object. If you're going to draw manually the drawing operations, like drawing a line with a shader or whatever, or if you want to apply it to an entire view, as I was saying before, that's what render effect is for. So you can create a render effect that uses a shader as inputs uh, and then apply that to a view or a render node, and it will apply to all operations that happen on that view or render node. Let's talk about what happens for a typical shader running on every pixel of an image. So first of all, we have the input color. This is the color that would be used if we didn't have this extra shader lo logic kicking in. That goes in through our shader program, and then out the other side comes the color that we have computed. So if we take a look at the shader code here, we have the coordinates. That is the XY location of this pixel in the overall rendering surface. Here, I'm creating a static red color, and I'm going to mix that. Just do a simple linear interpolation and use half red and half half whatever the original color was. So if we look at that, it looks something like this. We may have had an image coming in, and now we're going to run the shader logic on it, and we're going to tint every single pixel red along the way. So if we go back to the demo that we saw before where I was just blurring the background, the reason that I was doing that was I wanted to pop something to the foreground to draw the user's attention to that picture, much like a photographer draws the user's attention to whatever is in focus and then everything else just kind of fades into the background. So the other thing I wanted to do with this demo was to have a label that is applying additional shader logic on top of the blur that's happening in the background. So let's take a look at how that happens. You can see that where it says Ocean View Crete. Um, that is some shader logic that's doing both a blur as well as a frosted effect on top of it. So we can take a look at the way that that works. Uh, so first of all, let's look at the containment hierarchy. So we have the overall container that is the picture gallery that has all of those views inside of it. That's the thing that gets blurred by the render effect that we saw earlier. On top of that, we have a pop-up that's coming up in the front, and that is an image view. And then on top of the image view is a text view. The text view, all that's doing is drawing the text onto a transparent background. The actual shader logic is running on the entire image view, although it's only applying to the pixel inside of that label area down at the bottom. So first of all, this is how we actually uh, create and pass in values for the shader. First of all, we're going to set the height and width so it knows how big the rendering surface area is, and then it, that allows it to calculate what the label area is, where it's actually going to apply the shader logic. And it's going to create the runtime shader effect and tell it the value, uh, the, the name of the variable where it's going to pass in that input color, which is input shader. And then it sets the render effect on the view. 
All right, here's where we actually create the runtime shader logic itself. We're passing in a string that contains all the code. You can see the uh, variables that we have up the top called uniforms for the width and the height of the area, as well as the input color that's coming in. Uh, we have the coordinates that are telling us the X, Y location of that input value. We're going to create, we're going to calculate that value up front. We're just going to do an eval on the chords, and that says, here's what the input value is. If we are not in the label area, we're just going to return that value. We don't want to do any shading when it's on top of the label, so then we just return current value. Otherwise, if we're in the label area, then we go on to the next step. So there's two parts to that. One is if we're inside of the label area and not on the edges, things get a little bit funny when you blur on the edges. Uh, but we're, if we're inside the label area, then we're going to do a simple box blur. This is not as good as the render effect blur, nor is, is it as fast. Uh, but it shows you just a, a way to get a simple blur for the pixels that I want under that frosted area. It's simply going to combine the 25 pixels that surrounds the pixel where we're actually calculating a value for right now and then average those. And then I want a frosted effect on top of that. So now I've blurred those background pixels under the label. And then I want to apply a simple gradient that's going to be opaque white at the upper left down to mostly transparent white down at the uh, lower right. And that is going to basically expose more and more of the visual as you see here at the top of the slide. Uh, so to do that, we have this lighten factor where we calculate what's going to happen in this linear gradient. And then again, we do a mix, which is just a linear interpolation of whatever the original pixel value was with this lightening factor that we have applied to it. And that is it. Thank you. Thanks.